there will now be uh, a, what's called a moderated open panel debate. Now, we did start late, and I'm going to factor that in because I do want the maximum amount of time given to you, the audience, to make your points, ask your questions, and make your comments. So I'm going to reduce the uh, moderated panel debate to about 45 minutes, and that will give you also about 45 minutes to ask your questions and so forth. Um, I, I'd like to go to my left, so to speak, and invite one of the uh, speakers here, perhaps Jeffrey, to uh, make uh, comments. And, and then basically the panelists feel free to come in in a, in a, in a respectful and gentlemanly way and uh, have a, a discourse, if you like, um, about this evening's uh, subject. So, Jeffrey, if you want to say something. Um, yes, I haven't really prepared anything for this part. I'd just like to clear up a factual inaccuracy, if that's all right. Robin Tilbrook said that um, Nick Griffin was trying to raise money for the BMP from, um, from Colonel Gaddafi, and it was rather recently. It was actually 25 years ago. Um, Nick Griffin was in the National Front at the time, not the BMP, and it was long before fundamentalism had made any kind of appearance in this country, so I think conditions were rather different then. I realize that's somewhat off topic, but I found it needed correcting. Um, keep my comment short. Yes, please do. Um, Andrew Copson made a, um, a comment about the decline in racism, um, which accompanied the increase in immigration. I'm not sure how you would measure decline in racism. I think what we've seen an increase of is um, an increase in thought crime legislation, which sort of determines what people can and can't say. And given that people are so constrained by the law these days, then um, probably they're less inclined to express racist sentiments than they would have been in the past. I mean, it's, uh, it, is, it is measured, of course, in polls and surveys such as British social attitudes and so on and so forth, and it's often measured by saying, for example, who you'd be happy to have as a neighbour, who you'd be comfortable with in, in social environments. So that's how it's measured, and that's how the decline in racism over the last 50 years is evidenced. And it is clearly evidenced. <laughs> A lot of people now feel it's against the law to express such sentiments, so they'd be disinclined perhaps to say what they mean in, in some cases. Well, that doesn't mean that you can sort of make it up and say that that's what they really mean. Abdullah, do you want to come in? Yeah, uh, actually a number of points I want to respond to uh, Jeffrey about. Um, can we just keep to a couple of points rather than lots yeah, sure. and lots of points? Sure, sure. Um, one of those points was that uh, some Apparently, an anecdotal evidence, some Muslims attacked um, some, some uh, English people somewhere in, in the UK, and this is proof of Islam application. I could give you 10 times the number of reports of Muslims getting packy bashed by um, uh, you know, thugs. Uh, some of them are pro-BNP thugs. Uh, is this now, is this now uh, uh, can I use this and say, oh, are all English people are violent because a few thugs went and attacked? And I must say the statistics, are that more Muslims suffer from uh, racism and attacks than uh, non-Muslims. So, I mean, how would you answer that one, Jeffrey? My point would not be that Muslims are intrinsically violent, and that wasn't the point I was trying to make. And um, I wasn't trying to say that in the country overall that the country is being Islamified, but I would say that certain areas are. Tower Hamlets, I took as just one example. There are parts of Oldham, Bradford, Leeds, up, you know, Newham, where you have the same kind of situation. And in these communities, where, which are often quite poor, where people actually don't have the opportunity of, of leaving quite so easily, as perhaps Alan was suggesting, um, People do suffer if they're not part of the dominant group. The dominant group has become Muslim. There's a feeling that they can't go into the local park because, you know, that's their space. They can't walk down our street, you know, because that's, that's the Muslim space. People do feel that those areas are becoming Islamified. But I'm aware that if you go out to Henley-on-Thames or something, you know, Boris Johnson's constituency, you, you wouldn't see too many Muslims or have too much trouble. Yeah, yeah, it's, like, uh, it's like saying, like, Stamford Hill is uh, being... Yes, you know, just, Judaified because it has, you know, a, a Jewish majority of the Jewish population, or, or um, that uh, Lambeth is being Afro-Caribbeanized because they're the black population and so on. When the immigrants get here, they get put into certain sections. It's not that uh, it's actually just an erroneous topic to say they're being Islamified because we're talking about the British society, and of course you're going to get neighbourhoods which are predominantly one or the other, and over time they might uh, disperse uh, and as they're being absorbed into the population. But every time uh, that uh, immigrants have ever come to England, for example, East uh, London, where you have all the Bangladeshis, before they were owned by the Jews during the 1920s and so on. And 
Maybe we should have had a debate back then. Said, is England being Judified? And the, so the I'm sure debate, it'd be right? much more in sync with the, 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 the debate going on in Germany at that time. Well, the Aliens Registra the Aliens Act was put forward in, in 1905 because of the, um, the strange effect on people of, um, of Polish and Russian Jews who were appearing at that time. So w there was a debate back then. There were many debates. So, so you know, what we're doing now is nothing new. Uh, Alan, you wanted to say something? Yes, um, I live in Newham, and uh, uh, you've mentioned a few times about Newham. I live in a Muslim majority area, as I say. It's actually an interesting place to live in. Uh, and I embrace living in there, and there are some very hilarious and not so hilarious situations. If I said to you the, the most, um, the largest and most vital of the, of the mosques and many around our way shares a wall with an off-license, with a large off-license, buy your beer here notice sticking out, they're sharing the wall, and run by Bangladeshis, you realize actually this is a society that's actually, it, it, it isn't black and white, it isn't set in aspic as, as as seems to be argued on my left, but actually there's a lot of variety. There's a, a very popular halal restaurant right by the bus stop where I get the bus down there. And last, last February, they were running a Valentine's dinner dance down there. Well, Valentine's dinner dance is a very English or probably American concept, but they're running it in this Muslim, uh, Muslim restaurant. Life is not all black and white. There are mixtures going on. And for those of us that enjoy the diversity and enjoy living in that sort of thing, there was no threat in it. There was no... It, it is a changing environment in which it's a good place to live. I embrace it. That doesn't stop me, however, saying that aspects of Islam and aspects of Hinduism and aspects of all sorts of things. I'd like to have a go at the humanist in a minute, if it fits within the debate tonight. Um, there are aspects which we want to debate. And that's why these functions like this are very good. But, but let's not get it wrong. Newham is a good place to live because of its diversity. And I'm proud of the fact that London opens its doors to many people and from right way around the globe. That is, as I understand it, God's world has come to London. Uh, Father Frank? Um, two points. Uh, one uh, in response to uh, what Andrew just said about the virtues of liberal democracy. I would like to remind ourselves of the fact that since 9-11, we have had two wars, two aggressive wars unleashed against two Muslim countries in the name of liberal democracy. Um, the, the old cliche that democracies do not start wars, it, it is dictatorships or totalitarian states which do, is no longer valid. Certainly the Iraqi war, by now I think very few people would deny that it was illegal it was not authorized by a second uh, Security Council resolution. Even the, um, uh, the Attorney General, uh, Lord Goldsmith, I think it was, uh, said that regime change would have been in, uh, uh, not a legal basis to start a war. In fact, that's what happened. We were lied to by uh, Bush and Blair about the weapons mass rush of blah, blah, blah. So, and we know what has happened to Iraq after the invasion of the country has been martyred. And even now it goes on. Uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, I would like to say, first of all, that I do support the British Army in Afghanistan. They are serving the country to do their duty. I do not though, believe that the war is necessary. I think it is unjustified. I think the war will lead nowhere. It is a futile and stupid war. It cannot be won. And indeed, even the much maligned Taliban, after 9-11, when the Yanks had given the ultimatum, you've got to give us Bin Laden, have moved towards, they called uh, a meeting of um, Islamic specialists, and they had concluded well, we can't give up Bin Laden to infidels. That contradicts our values. And the Pashtun Valley, incidentally, says you cannot give up a host. But we'll ask him to leave. So Bin Laden could have, uh, Al-Qaeda could have been got out of Afghanistan. But the decision had already been made for Bush and Blair to invade. So both wars, conducted in the name of uh, liberal democracy, sanctioned by the British Parliament, in this case, were unjust wars. So quite clear, n not everything is so uh, hunky-dory about liberal democracy. Uh, the second point, minor point about... Uh, sorry, uh, Frank, can um, Andrew just come in on that? I, I just want to politely remind... Oh, sorry, can I make a very brief point? The oh. only brief point I want to make 
about uh, uh, Jeffrey, the very painful case of a clergyman who was attacked. And uh, that is, of course, absolutely awful. But I remember when I was uh, training for a priesthood in East Oxford, uh, which is the more immigrant-based part of Oxford, Father Martin Flatman, a lovely Anglo-Catholic priest, told me, you know, in this area I get spat upon sometimes. In fact, the only people who are nice to me are the Muslims. He said that. I shall always remember that. Thanks, Frank. Um, I'd just like to politely remind the speakers that the debate this evening is the Islamification of Britain, reality or myth, as much as I value your comments, Father Frank. Um, would uh, Andrew like to respond nonetheless to uh, <laughs> another issue? Well, I mean, I don't want to, I, nothing really that much to respond to. I didn't say that liberal democracies don't go to war or that they don't start wars. I simply recommended liberal, uh, the liberal democratic framework as a framework for living together in a, in a shared society. Um, however, I think it is worth pointing out that when uh, liberal democracy is maligned in that way, um, speakers very often on the one hand say liberal democracies do this, and then on the other hand to say uh, what is, is good as counterpose this liberal democracy, they then bring out the institutions of liberal democracy like attorney generals and international law and public protest and, and inquiry and so on. And so I think that the, you know, life is imperfect and there are two sides to every system of organizing ourselves. Um, Robin, would you like to say something? to what's being said. I've got some doubt really as to whether we actually live in a liberal democracy. And if you think about, uh, for instance, the government that we've got at the moment, um, this has got a historically large majority. It's got a majority that can rewrite the constitution at will. Um, and 21% um, of the electorate voted for it. Um, what kind of liberal democracy is that? And uh, I, I think I would like to come back about the point about Nick Griffin, because actually it's not 25 years ago. Um, and um, any of you who want to check it out can actually go onto YouTube. Uh, and there's a, there's, um, a YouTube um, of him being interviewed explaining why he'd um, gone to see Colonel Gaddafi to raise money. How many years ago was it then? How many years ago was it? About 15 years ago. When did it take place? Do you know which year? About 15 years ago. 1986, nearly 25 years ago. Um, I, I, I'd like to um, ask uh, the BAP representative a question of, of my own. I, if your party came to power in this country, um, would you guarantee the rights of the Muslim citizens of this country to worship freely or not? We, as to my knowledge, we have no plans to take away anybody's religious freedom. It's a great tradition of this country that people should have religious freedom. So is that a yes to a guarantee? That is a yes. Certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, Alan, you want to say a word? Yes, I want to come back onto the issue of Sharia, if I may, and I want to uh, uh, attempt to take Abdullah to task. He won't mind. He and I have debated a number of times on television and elsewhere, so I will I'll do so. But he has said something tonight which he does say, and others say, uh, about Sharia law, which um, I don't think is the full story. You'll have heard Abdullah say that Sharia law, they're not really trying to promote or, uh, Sharia law in this country. Well, some Muslims are, and there's some Anglican archbishops who seem to think it's a good idea. I'd like to argue with them. But I actually want to challenge Abdullah on this thing, that he, okay, Sharia law is okay for Muslim societies, but not for, we're not trying to push it into uh, the UK. Uh, Paul told you earlier that he uh, became a Muslim. It would be mainstream Muslim th thought to tell you that he didn't convert to Islam, he reverted to Islam. Now, he'd never been, as far as I know, he'd never been a Muslim before in his life, but they would tell you he reverted to Islam, went back to Islam. Now, the heart of Islam theology is a something called fitra, that everything in the whole universe is Islamic. And therefore, actually, everything in England fundamentally is Islamic. It's part of the DNA. You and I actually are Islamic. In religious terms, Jesus if you want to go there, Jesus and Moses and Abraham and Adam were all Muslims. They didn't know it, but that is Islamic theology. If that is the case, and I think it is, Abdullah is not telling you the full story, is he, when he says that he's not interested in England becoming a subject to Sharia law. He must, as a Muslim, believe that England must become Islamic if it's going to get back to its natural state. It reverts to Islam. And if that is the case, he must actually be saying one day, perhaps not this year, 2009, one day he as a Muslim will want a, a 
Britain to be an Islamic state and therefore, therefore, all people to be under Sharia law. So I'd like to ask Abdullah if he was telling us the full story, because I don't think he was. Okay. Well, yeah, um, me and Alan Craig are old debating buddies and so on, as you can probably guess. Um, just to go straight to his points, firstly, I don't think he understands what the word fitra means. It means human nature. We basically believe that Sharia is made for human nature, for human beings. So every human being has the innate uh, propensity to uh, accept the Sharia and agree with, it, with, it, with the, the human fundamental tendencies. Every ideology on the face of this planet, or every belief system, what have you, always addresses the first conception of uh, human nature. Before you discuss anything else, you must define what human nature is, and then how do we address it. So in Islam, our concept is fitra. It's simple. He says, why is it that if, if we believe Sharia is the, the best system, that we're only wanting it for the Muslim world? Well, that's because the Muslim world is without Sharia. And, and to rebut uh, Andrew's point uh, before, the Muslim world is ruled over by dicta secular dictatorships. Dictatorships that would probably imprison me, for example, for being an extremist. And they would torture people like myself and, and even kill people like myself. And all done at the behest of certain governments in the West, like, uh, like in, in Washington and, uh, and uh, number 10 down the street, which are the friend, and they're calling them friends on the war on terror, allies on the war on terror, despots and dictators who help uh, suppress Islam. Islam so bad that they're going to um, validate oppression of it. But I want to respond to a few, a few of Alan Craig's points. But he, he keeps on go, harping on uh, that Islam is oppressive to women. And I, I'm going to get to that. But I think with Alan Craig, I think he's confused. You see, my, my colleague, Father Frank, I, I've read a lot of his literature. His basis is biblical, it is Christian. And of course, my other colleague on the left is liberalism and secularism, obviously, and humanism. But with Alan Craig, it's liberalism and Christianity. And when it suits him, he'll be a Christian. And when it suits him, he'll be a liberal. Let's apply liberalism on his own faith. Let's see what we get. In 1 Timothy 2, it says, uh, uh, verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not, was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved by childbirth. So that's all right. I'm giving, I'm giving you a lot of latitude here because you're the only Muslim speaker on this. <laughs> it is not on topic, but sure. I'm giving you a little bit of latitude because you're the only Muslim. Can we debate it? Please? Because, sure. because, uh, debate Chris because this, is, this is not the subject of this evening, although it's absolutely entertaining. Sure. Right. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, it's, a, it's about your criteria. It's about the criteria of judging the issue of the supplication Sharia. How do you judge it? Do you judge it according to the liberal yardstick? Do you judge it according to the Christian yardstick? Do you judge it according to the, the fascist yardstick, and so on? There are different, uh, it's different criteria, and I'm arguing that for Alan Craig, that he should be consistent. Either he's Christian or he's liberal. And once you've chosen a, a position, then we can debate further. Can I come back on that? Briefly. I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm saying quite simply that in Britain today, we treat men and women equally before the law. They are equal, of equal worth. That is what we do. It doesn't always work out like that. Of course it doesn't. But in law, that is the uh, British ideal. That is part of our, uh, our built-in values in Britain in the 21st century. And therefore, Sharia law is completely inappropriate to that because it does not treat women the same as men. That is what I'm saying. I'm very happy to debate Christianity and the treatment of women within the church, but it didn't seem to me to be the topic for tonight. It, it, indeed. No. Uh, just very briefly. Okay. Um, Firstly, I don't think it's been substantiated that Islam does treat women uh, unequally. You, you provide me a definition of e equality and provide me a definition of, of the human nature, men, women. So, you know what? I had a debate with the, the atheist Dan Bark on the same issue, and he said to me that uh, Islam is sexist. And I said, uh, because the men and women are, are given different things. And I said, the nature is sexist, because why is it the man can't reproduce? Why is it the man is, is given... Uh, uh, more testosterone and uh, stronger and bigger. Why is this? In nature, we, maybe we should, we should complain to nature. Maybe it's nature's fault. Uh, what Islam says, what Islam says, 
is not that one is better than the other. It just says that uh, both of them have different specializations, and, you know, and each can cooperate for the be better good of, of human reproduction and society. What's wrong with this? Okay. Um, we're gonna, no, we're gonna, I'm going to move on. Um, I, I, I would, however, like to... In, in, India, we'll, we'll come back to that. I, I want to ask Alan uh, a question of my own, um, as genuine uh, plea for clarification. Um, you, you, you say very clearly that you're in favor of liberty and diversity, and you and you've spoke very eloquently about your uh, experiences in, in your home borough, and I certainly respect that. But h how is that to be reconciled with your um, advocacy of banning the burqa? Because it, it seems to me that there's, uh, I don't understand how you can affirm freedom and then deny the right of pious Muslim sisters to dress as they please according to their faith. Can I just define terms? Let's be clear about this. The only aspect of Islamic dress that I'm objecting to is the face veil. Uh, people, uh, I want to be clear about that because I'm not including the hijab or any other aspect at all. Uh, what actually I find aspects of Islamic dress really quite attractive personally uh, of, of all sorts. So no, it's not an issue and same with African dress and so on. I live in, a, as I say, I live in a multicultural one, I find that attractive, but, but, and this is the important thing, the face veil is a statement to people, it's a very passive statement, it's a, pace, it's a barrier between, it's a deliberate barrier, and it basically says, I do not want you to be in relationship with me, I do not want to be in relationship with you, therefore, that's what it says, and that's why I object to it. Now, how can a society say that it uh, wants to ban something in the name of freedom? Well, freedom isn't absolute. I hate to tell you, but you're not allowed to undress completely in here. None of you are. I expect if, if I do, you'd be quite glad that I'm not allowed to choose to be completely free and get undressed. Our society has got rules about that, and it says you're not allowed to sit here uh, completely undressed, completely naked. So we acknowledge that our society has rules and regulations. I'm not actually allowed to drive on the right-hand side. It's basic to a society. So our society can say, wear whatever you clothes you like, but, Alan Craig, you cannot strip off naked in public, okay? And it can say to other people, wear whatever clothes you like, but you cannot wear this deliberately anti-social piece of clothing, the face veil. You can do anything else you like. And that's what I mean by freedom. Um, during the q and I will I will certainly invite questions from sisters who wear niqab or hijab or whatever to make comments from the floor, but not at the moment, sister, because this is a discussion at the panel. So, um, Andrew, you wanted to ask Abdullah a question, I think. Well, I was... Is this working? Yeah. I it was is. just wondering if Abdullah was going to answer Alan's question about whether he wouldn't prefer at some point if Britain would be uh, under some sort of Sharia law, because he didn't answer it. I don't know. Well, I'll make it clear. Um, basically, I believe uh, that Sharia law is a system that is um, more uh, consistent with human nature in dealing and addressing human nature. So, as, every, as you believe that liberalism is also the best system for mankind, and a communist would believe communism is the best system for mankind. So, if we're asked, wouldn't you like to see all mankind under this system? I said, well, obviously, we'd, we'd all of us say the same, because if we didn't, then we don't believe in our own system. And that's what everyone answers. But suddenly, it's really bad for a Muslim to say that. Oh, you're being intolerant. You can't. Well, I can argue that liberals are intolerant. You're so intolerant, you don't even let our own countries go rule under Sharia. You support dictators. You'll, you'll do anything to torture and kill Muslims. <laughs> uh, uh, sec uh, second I think, it was a, I think it was a yes. But, um, I mean, it's, it's certainly not the case to say, for example, that uh, liberalism somehow forces itself on people. It's a very uh, clear part of a liberal approach um, to, to life in a shared society, that people have the freedom to pursue uh, their own religions and non-religious beliefs and to govern themselves as long as they don't harm others in, in whatever way they wish. So I think it's, a, it, it's not a fair uh, attack to say that liberalism is somehow comparable to another system of law that uh, imposes itself on people in that way. Well, well tell it to the American Marines that have come to okay. liberate Iraq for freedom and democracy well, under bombs. Well, I won't bombs. because that's got nothing to do with it. I'm talking well, about liberalism as a, sure. a way of living um, together in a shared society. I, I have a question for Father Frank, if you don't mind. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, said in that rather long and unintelligible speech uh, about Sharia law. Um, can you clarify in very simple words what he was getting at and what you think he was getting at and, and what, how do you evaluate that? Um, well, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury is not, uh, although I do admire his um, 
uh, piety, spirituality, is not a man whom I would like normally to be uh, interpreted, want to interpret, because, again, he's so dense. Uh, I actually defended him, which doesn't um, often happen, because we are, in a way, at the opposite ends of the theological spectrum. He's a, a liberal uh, Catholic. I'm a conservative uh, Anglo-Catholic. But uh, on that particular occasion, I was actually at the time living in, in the Middle East. I was in the Gulf, in Qatar, in Doha. I was interviewed by Al Jazeera. And I defended uh, uh, the Archbishop. Um, what uh, he was trying to say was that uh, the law, in a way, must reflect the developments in society. And uh, insofar as uh, Britain is, uh, uh, to some extent, um, affected, or they are an important um, Muslim minority, some of those um, the values of a minority should be reflected in the law. Now, this is not, I mean, I, I, it's not funny, I should be a, uh, an apologist for Sharia, um, but, uh, and I would, like, incidentally, I would like to say that I understand, I have no problem with accepting, recognizing the Islamic position, because Islam has a superiority complex. There is no question about that. It believes itself to be a final revelation. But Christianity has no doubts about its own truth. So in a sense, although we may be a little more coy, a little more diplomatic in expressing, there is no question we also believe we have a truth. But uh, coming back to Paul's question, I don't want to duck it. Um, I, uh, I, I, I think there is an example already, for example, in this country. Take the example of a Catholic church. Uh, there is something called the Holy Wheel, the Sacrota, which grants annulments to marriages which have taken place in this country to Catholics on the basis of its own um, you know, rules and regulations. And so you could argue, how could a tribunal which sits in Rome actually have consequences of an influence of what happens in this country? Well, it does happen. It's not a perfect analogy. So similarly, um, it may well be that some degree of uh, voluntary, uh, already Muslims do abide to some extent by Sharia principles so voluntarily. So if English law were to some extent to recognize that, I would not see anything per se uh, uh, objection provided. And we know the Archbishop was not talking about chopping off of hands or anything like that. He was talking about matters of family. Uh, right of family law. So per se, I would myself defend him on that one. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Robin wanted to say something. Okay. Um, I'd say, first of all, that English law does actually recognise the right of, um, say, business people um, who are Muslims to have their contracts um, adjudicated under Sharia principles, but that is on the basis of a situation where people have actually agreed to that and signed up to a, a, a a, an arbitration or a adjudication decision um, to be made um, valid in English law. So the agreement to arbitrate is valid. You can choose any system of rules to be um, your system of rules for the adjudication to take place. Um, I think where the, where the problem emerges, though, isn't where people are choosing. It's where and, and this is what happens with the legal system, after all, where the choice is imposed upon them. In other words, they are required to deal with their disputes, say, under Sharia law. That would be something that we would be totally opposed to. Um, and, and that's when you get from a situation where people are consenting to it to a situation where people are finding it imposed on them. Uh, and you simply can't have multiple legal systems operating within the same territory. It doesn't work. We know, um, in response to, to Robin's point, um, I think you can have multiple legal systems operating. I think historically you did. The, the Ottomans had the millet system, and of course um, Islam had a concept of multiculturalism where every community had their own law system that they could refer to. And they could choose to opt out of it if they want to and go to see the Islamic uh, uh, court, which uh, according to a lot of historians, most of them actually did. 
And I, I've advised you to check the history on this. It's, it's a very fascinating situation. It's Islamic concept of multiculturalism. I only wish, I think my, own, my only lesson, I, I, I guess, the, the only aspect of Islam I like to bring for Britain is maybe this one aspect to solve your multiculturalism problem. You have a multiculturalism problem because some people, they believe in freedom, but they also believe in their own culture. And so based on their taboos, they will now hip, um, hypocritically go against freedom and, liberal, uh, and liberalism to um, impose their cultures on others. So I would say that the best way to deal with this is the Islamic multiculturalism. And I would, you know what, I would be very much agreeable to, being, um, to be given, uh, to be treated as a, as a uh, vimmi, if you know the Islamic concept, concept of this word, a person under protected contract, under a British state whereby I'll be respected, whereby my livelihood will be protected, whereby I could um, practice my faith, I could go and worship as I please, and no one would question our women, our women who they say, well, we believe in women's rights, women should choose, but you women, if you wear the burqa, we're going to ban it. See, this is the hypocrisy of this democracy. It is the hypocrisy of those who, is, who claim to espouse freedom and, and, and liberalism and so on. And I, I'm not talking about Andrew, because I know Andrew, he's, he's consistent, Frank is consistent, but uh, some people over there, maybe with the exception of Robin, are inconsistent. They say, we believe in democracy but you, and freedom, but you must restrict your freedoms. Isn't it, did, did, did not Rousseau say, I hate what you have to say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it? No. Was it, was it who is it? No Voltaire. Voltaire. Oh, he didn't say it it's all French to me. It's all French. Um, uh, uh, Alan uh, is, is bursting to get in. I really am. I'm dollars talking nonsense, and he knows he's talking nonsense. Does it really think that a democracy is saying that everything you can do, everything you ever like? Doesn't democracy say, will you drive on the left hand side or the right hand side and it can choose? Uh, we all know there have to be rules, there have to be regulations. The whole point of democracy is can you extend that freedom as far as is reasonable? There are occasions when my freedom imposes on somebody else's, so society has to step in and says, no, you can't. So it's, it's an old chestnut, Abdul. Every time I debate him, he throws his run out. How can you ban something in the name of freedom? Well, actually, society does ban some things in the name of freedom. It's actually recently decided in the name of freedom to ban smoking. I personally don't object with it, I don't agree with it, but that's what they've decided to do. Society is able to take these views, that's what it does. It doesn't stop us being a democracy. So come on, Abdullah, let's, uh, let's move on from this silly uh, point. I think the humanist uh, is also wanting to speak. I I think it's also worth pointing out that the burqa has not been banned. I mean, to say that there's a, there's a hypocrisy in democracy because you say you want freedom and then you ban something and you ban the burqa, I just remind you, it, it hasn't actually been banned, right? Okay. Um, carry on. Carry on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Basically, then why are we having this debate? We shouldn't have any debate on the ban. In France, they're going to have a debate on the ban of the burqa. Why have it? If you're not going to do it, then why where's the debate? Why debate on? Why have this voting for in in Switzerland for whether people can, of their own free will and choice, or with their own funds, build buildings in the shape of, the, as, of their pleasing? Why why have this this referendum? Why? It's because it offends the cultural, uh, the cultural values of a particular faction uh, in the Western society. And this is the hypocrisy I'm talking about. It's not hypocrisy. This is what we do in democracy. We debate these issues. We come up here, and I'm proposing the idea that... that... Okay. It's what we do. It's democracy. We debate these issues, Abdullah. And we respectfully debate. I respect you, but your views themselves are nonsense. I'm putting forward the proposition that the niqab only should not be allowed in our society. Nothing else, that's all. It's a valid proposition. Okay, so that, yeah. then, then should we um, start a debate on whether people who uh, leave one religion should be killed then? Should we start? If I want to say, let's start this debate then. Let's have this debate. People will say this is absurd, this goes against our liberal principles, right? Yes? So then why debate on, so, so on these other issues which are going against liberal principles? Again, you have no philosophical basis, no basis to say that we should ban things except pure arbitrary culture. You say the niqab is, uh, is uh, uh, preventing that woman from, uh, 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 I don't know, having some kind of relationship with you, and I, and I mean it in a platonic sense. <laughs> All right, but she's not physically harming you. Isn't that what freedom is about, right? 
The, you know, the, the right to throw your fist ends at the beginning of my nose. Isn't that, isn't that your principle that you guys are meant to believe in? If, if freedom means freedom to follow your culture, then every civilization from time immemorial has always had that freedom. You're free to follow our culture. If you go out of it, then you're banned. Of course, that's not freedom. That's just the same status quo as always has been since time immemorial. Father, uh, sorry, you, you'll have your chance uh, in about seven minutes' time, actually. Father Frank. Um, a brief one of a niqab. I was on a conference in the States a few years ago, and uh, amongst the participants, there was a couple from South Africa, a Muslim couple, husband and wife. She was called Amina. She, was, she wore a burqa and the niqab. And um, even some uh, other Muslims did not like her because they said that she gives Islam a bad, ma a bad name. She whis they whispered to me. In fact, she was humorous. She joked about looking like a ninja. She, uh, she took a great liking to me. Uh, when uh, we broke up, she said, Father Frank, we'll never forget you. I felt I was having a relationship with her. I don't know what her face looked like, but I'm reminded of what Oscar Wilde said. Uh, many people have faces such that you wish to forget after you've seen them. So uh, although, although certainly it is not cultural in the West to have, uh, I think I do not believe that necessarily it stops you from having a relationship, a moral, spiritual relationship with a person. I don't believe that. I think we may have drawn to perhaps a natural conclusion, unless any of the speakers... Well, or, or we can give more time to the, the, the floor. Yeah, uh, okay, all right. What we'll do now then, um, we're going to have a very short break, so see you very shortly for your discussion. Thank you.